What is up, Hill City? My name's Natalie, and I'm part of the team here. If this is your first time watching with us this morning, we want to say a special thank you for taking time out of your weekend to do online church with us. We want you to know that Hill City is a safe place for you. Kelly is watching me. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> I just see her. I just see her inch over. We want you to know that Hill City is a safe place for you to explore your faith. Wherever you're coming from, we want to walk with you through any doubts, fears, or questions you have about Jesus. If you're new around here, we want to know who you are. Head on over to this link to fill out a connection card so we can put some names behind who's watching with us and send you some fun mail. Make sure to check in on Facebook because all our check-ins this month donate money to the Barnabas Center here in Richmond. That's all from me. Next up, we've got a few songs and then the first message in our Peace With Us series. Thanks for being here. about to move I feel it in the wind you're about to ride in you said that you would pour your spirit out you said that you would fall on sons and daughters so come Your glory rushing like a flood 
seasons come quickly You have always been enough Though the night may get darker Though the waiting seems long You have always been faithful To remind me of your love
Well, hey, good morning, everybody. Um, hope you guys had a great Thanksgiving uh, with friends or family or however you spent it um, this year. And, you know, uh, Tick had uh, closed out the last uh, series, which was awesome. And we want to start something new here leading up through the Christmas season uh, in the season called Advent, which is this waiting for Jesus, right? So uh, this Advent was established a long time ago, and the idea is we go through the story and we wait for the arrival of Jesus. Now, we know the story of Jesus coming into this world, but uh, for us now, Advent also becomes this longing and this waiting for Jesus to come back. Uh, but we do this uh, with the Christmas story in mind. It's we're going to focus on uh, some certain elements here. And uh, this whole entire series leading up through Christmas and uh, what we'll do online and live uh, is around this idea of peace. Uh, peace is something that uh, we all need, right? We all need uh, peace. And I started thinking about, for me, what peace is like. And uh, it, it, started comes, it comes in different ways, right? There is, uh, for me, you can think about uh, golf. Like, I love being, like, mornings and the golf and the sun is up and the dew is just kind of drying on the ground. Like, that's so peaceful for me to, like, walk the golf course. Um, I think about uh, there's times when uh, we've gone to Lake Gaston at a friend's house, uh, um, usually every summer, not this summer, of course, but um, usually every summer we go to a friend's house in Lake Gaston. It's, like, the most peaceful place uh, in the world, I feel like. Uh, Lacey and I went to Belize uh, a couple of years ago probably the most peaceful vacation that we've ever had. And uh, no, our kids uh, weren't there. And I love our kids. Like, our kids are awesome. And we actually have a lot of fun with them when we go on vacation. But there's something that's a little more peaceful when you don't hear mom, 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 dad, 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 right? Like, so, um, but, so that, but when you think about peace, there might be some other things that come to mind for you. Um, but here's the thing that I realized as I was thinking through my elements of peace. Um, those are all circumstantial. Those are all temporary. Those don't really um, go beyond that little moment. And the reason why peace is such a prevalent theme whenever we talk about the Christmas story is because Jesus becomes the Prince of Peace. Uh, and we, we read that from Isaiah chapter 9 uh, in terms that the Messiah was going to come and, and one of the names that he would be called would become the Prince of Peace. And so there's something different about the peace of Jesus. There's something different that goes beyond our circumstances. And so what I wanted to talk through today and what I wanted for us to concentrate on today is simply this, that the transcendent peace of Jesus is not determined by our circumstances. The transcendent peace of Jesus is not determined by our circumstances. You know, a lot of people are talking about how rough of a year that this has been. And it's been rough, obviously. I'm not <laughs> demeaning that in any kind of way. And of course, we've heard about anxieties going up, uh, depression is up, uh, divorce rate is up, um, you know, alcoholism is up, and abuse is up, and all these things are up, right? And you look at the kind of the overall culture that we have right now towards one another uh, in this season has been pretty difficult and pretty divisive. But I would say that's been there for quite some time. And we've seen peaks and valleys with all this stuff, uh, you know, throughout different points of history. And it's all circumstance-based. This lack of peace, um, getting to 21, 2021, doesn't mean all of a sudden you're going to have peace. Uh, like one little thing curing in your, you know, getting better in your life doesn't mean all of a sudden you're going to have peace. There's, we need a different kind of peace, something that transcends our circumstances that can only happen uh, through Jesus. And the Christmas story is a one wonderful way to begin to engage this in our lives, to begin to discover, in particular, if you've never uh, decided to say yes to Jesus, or you don't consider yourself a follower of Jesus, or you're just trying to figure out faith right now, this season is a beautiful one to begin to look at what is the big deal about Jesus's arrival? Why does it mean so much, and how could that actually give me so much peace? All right, so over the next uh, few weeks, what we're going to do is we're going to spend some time building a foundation of how do we have peace in our life. And so if you're new to this whole faith thing, if you're trying to figure out where you stand, if you're trying to figure out whether or not you want to follow Jesus and what this might mean, and you have the opportunity to engage this season, this Christmas season, like, why is it such a big deal that Jesus arrived? Like, what does it actually mean? And how does it shape my purpose and identity? This is a wonderful time uh, to be watching and engaging 
engaging our community. Uh, I will cover this week and then uh, the third week of this, and then Nicole Eunice will be back next week to talk through as we kind of build this foundation here together. So first, how does the Bible actually talk about peace? You know, the main city in the Bible is Jerusalem, right? So if you're taking uh, notes, just write down Jerusalem. And here's what Jerusalem means. It means the city of peace. So even in the main place where, where God's people would reside, it was this idea that peace is a prevalent theme for God's people, or it at least should be. When you think about the start in Genesis 1, where the Bible begins, you know, in the garden, there was what? Peace. All right, in the garden, there's ultimate peace. Now, this word that we have in the Old Testament if you're not familiar with your Bible, our Bibles are divided into Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, in, in, in the Old Testament, it was written in Hebrew. And so the word that we have for peace is shalom, all right? It's shalom. Now, you might have heard that just, I don't know, in a movie someplace or if you have a Jewish friend or just been around stuff. Um, and so there was ultimate shalom. Now, here's what shalom is. Shalom is not just the absence of conflict, though a lot of times that can be the case, that peace, we think of peace and we think, oh, nations aren't at war or there is no conflict there. But it's, it's actually a little bit more than that. Uh, shalom means uh, wholeness, all right? So there's wholeness there. There's restoration, all right? All these things are so important. There's um, complete is another word so when you, when you look at shalom, there's, it's an all-encompassing thing. Um, it goes beyond just the idea of conflict. It goes beyond just the idea of um, no war or anything like that. And so within the garden, uh, it says that there was this shalom, there was this peace, there was this completeness, this, uh, this wholeness to how everything was. And then sin comes in and breaks that. And you know what's interesting is in Genesis chapter 2, in Genesis 2, it says that Adam and Eve uh, were naked and they, what, had no shame, all right? So where there's shalom, there is no shame. And so where there's the peace that we're supposed to have, uh, where shame should be um, pushed out of us. And we all know how difficult it is with shame and what that does to our lives. And so what happens is the reason that shame comes in is because of sin. And then as things started kind of progressing uh, throughout this, you, you know, we see in Genesis chapter 3 is where sin comes in and, and everything becomes broken and they're very aware of things now and shame is kind of rearing its ugly head and starts to impact everyone. And then this rescue story starts to happen in scripture. And uh, you kind of go through periodically and generation after generation and we, we come across these uh, prophets, all right, these prophets. And there's this one prophet uh, named named Isaiah. All right, so well, this is Isaiah here. All right, so this is Isaiah. Oops, I spelled it wrong. There we go. Isaiah. There's Isaiah, and uh, he seems angry for some reason in that little drawing, but it is what he is. So Isaiah is one of the prophets of God, and these prophets would, uh, they would receive a word from God, and I said this a, a few weeks ago, that how did you know a prophet was legit if the word came true? And Isaiah's word from God would uh, always come true, and so Isaiah would write down these words, and his scribes around him would write down these words from God, and one of the promises that God makes is that in Isaiah 66, 12, and he says this, he says, I will give Jerusalem, that, remember that city of peace, a river of peace and prosperity. And so what ends up happening then for uh, the, the, the Israelites at that point in time, they hear this word from God. And so here's what they're waiting on. They're waiting for this Messiah, okay? This Messiah or this Savior, the Savior that would come. And the Savior that would come would bring what? Ultimate peace, all right? So or shalom. And all of that is really important to, to kind of get the picture of why Jesus coming into it, why some of the wording around peace and what, why it was so important then for, to think through, okay, God promised that we would have this peace and this prosperity and restore his kingdom. And so they were waiting for this Messiah, this Savior, to actually come and to make things whole again, to make things complete, to restore the brokenness between the relationship between God and his people. And so that becomes this massive theme and what the Jews are waiting for in the midst of this. And so when we get to the uh, Christmas story in Luke chapter 1, we read this part, uh, which is the story of John the Baptist and Zechariah is having this prophecy and, and he begins to speak this word of God. And it says this, because of God's tender mercy, the morning light, all right, so the morning light uh, from heaven, this is referring to Jesus, is about to break upon us. And so 
the idea of the Christmas story is that uh, there's all this darkness that's coming in and light is going to come out of this. And so the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. And so this John the Baptist who became, uh, he, he prepared the way for Jesus to come. That He helped lead people to this path and this path is going to take them to ultimate peace. And that peace was found in Jesus. Now, when the birth happens and Jesus becomes who he, we kind of know him as throughout scripture, he begins to have all these teachings. And Jesus talks this way about his, himself around peace. He says, I'm leaving you with a gift. All right, so pay attention to that gift. What's that gift? It's of peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a what? Gift. The world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. And so what Jesus is trying to get them to say is, listen, if you're with me, I can give you a gift that's transcendent. I can give you a gift that goes far beyond your circumstances. I can give you a gift of peace that nothing or no one else can give you. The world will promise things that it cannot give you. Uh, money will promise things you can, that it cannot give you. Uh, relationships will promise things that it can't fully get you. Only Jesus has the transcendent peace that goes beyond all of our circumstances. So even when you think about this season of time right now, and we're like, Man, all the, the virus, the racial tension, the politics, uh, the depression, anxiety, all those things. And you think, where in the world could we discover peace? And what Jesus says is that, man, I have a gift for you that goes far beyond your circumstances, far beyond what the world can give. And no matter what happens in your world or what happens in your lifetime, I am with you and you have no reason to be worried or to be afraid. Can you imagine living a life where you didn't have to have this idea of like, I'm so worried or I'm so afraid or I'm so fearful or anything like that because they have such an inner peace about us that transcends any kind of understanding, that transcends our circumstances. This guy named Paul came after Jesus and became uh, one of the biggest writers and authors of the rest of the New Testament. And he does something in his letters that I think is pretty interesting. He uses this phrase all the time. He, has, he uses this phrase grace and peace. All right, so grace and peace. And so uh, the phrase begins to sh shift a little bit. Um, grace uh, was uh, a word that was used, um, it's called charis or haris, um, which means joy or beauty and life through Christ. And um, that, was the, that was a Greek greeting. And then shalom, which was peace, was the way that Jews greeted themselves and, and greeted one another. So what, what Paul does is he merges the, the Greek and the Jews or the Gentiles and the Jews, the two kind of prevailing people that were there. And he says, hey, I'm bringing this stuff together. And in this grace and peace, in this one little saying, so even when you see grace and peace in scripture, that I hope that this sticks with you. What, what, what Paul is saying here is, I want to do this kind of, I want to remind you of something and I want to challenge you with something. And here's what Paul is saying here. The grace we've received from Christ instills a peace we can have in the present. And so he's saying that this grace that you've received gives us a peace. That this grace that you've received, which is a gift, you don't earn it, it's a gift from God. And that the challenge is that we, it's a peace that we can have that transcends everything. When Paul writes his letters, he's writing his letters uh, sometimes when he's in prison or under great persecution or just getting beaten or um, almost dying or on the run, whatever. So he's got all these things going on when he's writing these letters. And so I think it's important for us then to say, like, all right, when he's talking about grace and peace and how does he get there and what does it mean for him? And he gives us these four key things through one of his letters that I think are pivotal for us to have this foundation of what it means to have this transcendent peace and is through following Jesus. And he wrote this letter to the church at Philippi. And in chapter four of this letter, he says it this way. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. And let me pause for a second. He doesn't say rejoice in the Lord sometimes. He doesn't say rejoice in the Lord when it's convenient. He doesn't say most of the time rejoice. He says rejoice in the Lord always, meaning no matter what your circumstances is. Why? Grace and peace, this gift that we've had, allows us to have this peace in the present. He says, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, again, not in some situations, but what? Every situation, 
by prayer and petition and thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. He continues on in verse 8. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And then the God of peace will be with you. And I love this passage because what Paul is trying to do is he's trying to get us to see there is a peace that's transcendent. There is a peace through following Jesus that goes beyond our circumstances, but there's a way to go about this peace. And he says, if you do these things, then the peace will happen. If you do these things, then you will experience this peace of God that's so uh, transcendent and this gift that God actually has for us. So what are these four keys to peace? The first one is this, to rejoice. To rejoice. So when you think about this idea of rejoicing, he says to rejoice at all times. And he, he comes up on this interesting uh, way to say the, rejoice, the rejoicing that happens in our life is this inner joy. And this inner joy is so transcendent. This inner joy goes beyond everything. This, this inner joy uh, is beyond happiness. You know, it's cool to be happy. I'm down with happiness. But joy is an inner core level of who we are that no matter what is happening around us, it gives a different kind of perspective of what we're experiencing. And this joy, and this is what Paul says, this joy that you have, this rejoicing that you have, this acknowledging uh, that the Lord is near us, this joy that we have leads to gentleness. How often do you think about gentleness? I'll be honest, it's not something that I think about very often. Um, but then when I was going through my notes here and writing this stuff down and researching uh, a lot about gentleness, I, I, I discovered, man, some of the people I love being around the most, some of the wisest people that I know are so dang gentle. Some of the people that have gone through so many difficult things in life, there's a gentleness about them. You know, the, I think the two fruits of the Spirit that are listed in Galatians 5 that are often most forgotten are gentleness and self-control. Gentleness because we think it's weak. Gentleness because we're like, what about passion? And what about um, getting, uh, having righteous anger? That doesn't sound like gentleness. But I'm like, well, well, the way that if the fruit of the Spirit's working in us and the way that people um, experience us is through a gentle way. Even when we have to put truth in front of them, even when we have to address them in some kind of way, even if they don't agree with it, they feel like, man, it was done in such a gentle way that uh, they experience us in that manner. That is a indicator that the fruit of the Spirit is actually at work with in us. And of course, self-control is the other one that we always want to forget. We're like, wait, is that even in there as the fruit of the Spirit? But gentleness is a big one. You know, it's interesting, even when you look at the teachings of Jesus, gentleness was always, it was always there. The way he approached people that were hurting was what, with gentleness. The way that he would speak to people that disagreed with him was with gentleness. The way that um, people experienced Jesus was with gentleness. And you might be saying, he flipped over the table that one time, which is always the example people want to use about Jesus to like justify some kind of anger or whatever. And I'm always like, yeah, he, he did. And, and, and that's okay. Like being gentle doesn't mean that sometimes it's, something's not going to make you amped up on something. But I, I, I do think this though, and this is something that I think with gentleness and with people that I've experienced in my life, here's what I've seen, that gentle people may lose their cool, but they never lose their character. And that's something different because when a person has the fruit of the Spirit and gentleness is working through them, even if there's a moment where they get really amped up, they never lose their character. There's a gentleness in the way that they uh, express uh, what that, that might be boiling up inside of them. There's a way that they go about all those things. Even when Jesus flipped over the tables, let's not forget how he then approached people right after that to begin uh, to show who he was. The second thing in terms of layering in, uh, how do we build the foundation of peace? We rejoice. And then Paul says this, to be grateful in prayer. So have grateful, grateful prayer. Grateful prayer. Um, you know, when we begin to think about prayer, uh, you need to make time for prayer. You need to even sometimes create space for prayer, uh, find ways to pray during the day, like have this 
a part of your daily rhythm. Without it, we lose that center point. Without it, we're just on our own. Prayer allows us this connection to, to Jesus in um, a really interesting way. I, I started thinking about, we've Lacey and I have renovated uh, a bunch of houses um, in Richmond and some people have asked like do you guys love renovating houses and getting to that game and like buying and selling all that stuff and, and we kind of got into it by accident and some of them were good investments some of them <laughs> were not and um, but we we always did it, it kind of correlated with different times of ministry for us but every single construction project that we've done we would always have a place within that house that was like the centering point um quite often not in our most recent one but quite often it was always the staircase because there was never anything getting done on the staircase and it was the only part that was being untouched everything else was just destroyed but the staircase became this place where we would sit because if you've ever been in a construction project there's always a point where you're like this is it i might go over the edge and so for us we would be like or maybe it happens several times but we, we would sit on that and sometimes eat on the staircase and and we would just sit and talk. And, and here's what was interesting, and this is how it correlates to prayer. What we were seeing around us was stuff being torn down while some other things being built up. And if we aren't having that space in our lives to allow us to say, oh, this is what God is tearing down, and this is what he's building up, then we're going to miss it. We won't grow like we should. We won't be aware. We won't grow in wisdom. We won't grow in character. We won't grow in integrity. We won't, we won't have that peace that God's trying to instill in us through the ways that he's breaking down and building up. And prayer is that staircase. Prayer is that centering point that we have that allows us to see, oh, this is what God's doing. Now I begin to see this. Some of you guys that are, are really good with prayer. And, and I'm not a, I don't journal myself, but like I know several people who journal and they journal daily with their prayers and they talk about how, man, they look back and this journal becomes a centering point for them to, be, to begin to see, oh, look what God was doing here. I'm so grateful for the way that he has responded to me in my life. When we start thinking about um, obviously, we're coming off of Thanksgiving and a heart of gratefulness and, and everything. And, and here's what I think is important, too, when you think about peace. We have to be grateful. See, what Paul is saying here is like gratefulness and thankfulness, no matter what you're going through, um, is, is imperative to getting to a place of peace. Uh, the pathway to peace is acknowledging who you are right now. Okay, let me say that again, that the pathway to peace is acknowledging who you are right now. Ignoring and stuffing and whatever else to, to, to get around it, um, whatever's going on in your life will not lead you to a place of peace. Uh, you might be ignoring a pain. You might be ignoring a hurt. You might be ignoring certain things and thinking that you've dealt with it, but you haven't, and that means you won't have peace. I was thinking about this too. You know, even Tick said this uh, last week that just because you follow Jesus doesn't mean that there's not going to be pain, that there's not going to be hurt, that there's not going to be suffering or anything. But I think we also have to learn the difference between um, a hurt that allows us to grow and a harm that is really abusive and damaging. And a lot of times what ends up happening is we think everything has harmed us. Everything is so damaging and everything, and we kind of go on this more dramatic route of, of things. And whereas, no, you know what? That was actually just a little hurt. And that little hurt allowed you to grow. That little truth and the acknowledgement of where you are and who you are right now or what your relationships are like or where your state of mind is, acknowledging that hurt and experiencing that hurt is what actually allows you to grow. Not everything is a harm. Not everything is this massive trauma. Not everything is going to trigger you. Not any, like those things are true too in some cases, but man, we've got to understand that sometimes it's just a hurt and that hurt is going to allow us to grow. And so even when you think about um, in your own life, these things that, uh, how are you um, enabling yourself to have moments of gratefulness daily? How are you uh, being thankful to the things that you're going through, even in the midst of what can be pain? In the me Listen, this 2020 year, if we don't see it as an opportunity to grow, we're gonna miss it. Has it sucked? In some ways, yeah. Um, and I could list out a bunch of stories for like even for me in my own personal life and um, that it's been really a hard year. Uh, however, here's what I know, that when we turn that into thankfulness and we turn it back to God, this peace begins to get instilled in us that allows us to see, oh, I'm growing in wisdom. 
I'm growing in knowledge. I'm growing in relationship and intimacy with God. My relationships are getting better. I'm seeing a different perspective on life. How does that happen? Because we're thankful for the things that we go through. Um, one of the leading researchers uh, around happiness, her name's uh, Sonia uh, Liborinsky, um, she says this, um, she says, people who are inclined to savor were found to be more self-confident, extroverted, and gratified, and less hopeless and neurotic. Those skilled at capturing the joy of the present moment, hanging on to good feelings and appreciating good things are less likely to experience depression, stress, guilt, and shame. And so it's important for us to be thankful. It's important for us to, if without that thankfulness, we won't have peace. And so what ends up happening there is this is what Paul says in verse 7, that these two bring that transcendent peace of God. So this rejoicing and this gratefulness, this transcendent peace of God that goes beyond our circumstances, it starts happening in us internally at a deep core level that will end up guarding our heart. It guards our minds. And what does it guard our hearts and minds from? All the junk that happens. All the things that the world's trying to tell us that it's trying to give to us that only Jesus can give. It guards our minds and our hearts and puts us in the right frame of mind. Here's the third thing that Paul says. We need to be laser focused. Laser focused. Um, if you grew up in youth groups in the 90s, that probably would have been a Z instead of an S. But um, he wants to be laser uh, focused. And what does he say? What are we supposed to be focused on? On whatever is pure, whatever, whatever is noble, whatever is true, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. That those are the things that our minds get focused on. Now let me ask you this. Is that the case for you? Is that the case if you're like, oh man, overwhelmingly, I've been focused on the positive. I've been focused, I'm, an optim I'm, I'm so optimistic, I'm hopeful. I'm, I've been looking at what's pure and what's lovely and what's admirable. I've been searching for those things because I know that that's what sets my mind in the right direction. See, Paul says if you want peace, then you gotta be laser focused on these things. And so he's like, don't be negative. Don't be negative. He's, Paul's like, if you wanna have peace, then don't be a negative person. Don't be a complainer. Is another thing, don't be the person who lacks grace towards other people. Uh, we see this in so much of our pride and our arrogance and our self-righteousness around whatever hot cultural topic is happening right now. The amount of times that um, people lack grace towards one another, uh, whether that's how someone voted or, um, I don't know, how they treat the virus or whatever. I, don't, I mean, there's a bunch of examples. The lack of grace people are showing towards one another um, just, it shows we aren't, we, our minds are not focused on what's pure, what's noble, uh, what's lovely, what's admirable. Our hearts are not oriented towards graceful things. Our, our hearts are not in a thankful state because we're complaining, we're so dang negative and we're lacking grace towards uh, one another. So I would challenge you then to start thinking through, okay, what are the things in my life right now that I know I'm negative about or that I'm complaining about? Um, and then begin to see, all right, what's actually feeding my brain into this? Um, and, you know, Paul would say, hey, is there any envy or jealousy or towards someone else or maybe what they have or, or the way, what they're doing? And is that like affecting or impacting how you're viewing people and treating people? Um, Proverbs 14.30 uh, says this. It says that a heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. And so uh, we got to start thinking this. All right, if I, I want to have a heart that's at peace. And Paul would say, if you want a heart that's at peace, then what you focus on deeply matters. You see, when we focus on what is good, it enables us to put the bad in its proper perspective. This is not ignoring the bad. This is acknowledging who we are. This is acknowledging what we're going through. This is acknowledging the state of things and saying, I understand this is bad, but my focus is on what is good because that will always overwhelm the bad. And when my focus is where it should be, then this bad, I can begin to think, okay, here's an opportunity to grow. Here's an opportunity to gain wisdom. Here's an opportunity, God, to sharpen me. Um, this is something to fight through and have build resilience and be persistent through. It gives us a proper perspective. Here's the fourth thing and the last thing that Paul talks about here. He tells us to get after it, <laughs> to get after it. He says this right there in the last part, and he says, whatever you've learned from me, uh, whatever you're focusing on, whatever you've been around, he, he says, put it into practice. Okay, he doesn't say, 
whatever you've learned from me, take it in. It's great knowledge, right? Like, good, now you've got peace. Like, you know, he says, no, take all those things that you're focused on. Take the good, take the noble, the true, the lovely, the admirable, all those things. Take what you've seen and heard from me and my people and how we've lived out our life. And he goes, take those things and put it into practice. He says, unless you put it into practice, you will not experience the peace of God. But when you put those things into practice, meaning what you're focusing on and, and what you've seen from people who are wise, what you've seen from people who are resilient, what you've seen from people who are positive and optimistic, right? That there's this inner joy uh, that they have. When you focus on those things and you learn and you grow and you're around those kinds of people and you put into practice what they do, that's when you begin to experience the peace of God. So, so Paul kind of maps this out in these four things. He's like, hey, do these first couple of things here to uh, rejoice and to be grateful in prayer because that builds the kind of internal component that we have through a life with Jesus. And then he talks about, hey, pay attention to what you're focused on and what you're seeing in front of you and then put those things into practice with the right kinds of people and then externally it begins to come out of us. So there's this internal peace and then there's external peace that ends up happening in every, in every area of our life. I want to end with this story um, that I was reading, and I, I, I don't remember how many years ago I read this story, um, and it just like hit me um, like right in the heart when I heard this, because I was like, man, that's crazy that this is how <laughs> this song was written and the story that was behind it, because I just didn't know. In 1871, there's this guy named Horatio Spatford who um, lost everything in uh, the Chicago fire, and uh, um, right after that, his four daughters and his wife were um, about to sail across the Atlantic. But on, the, on their way, uh, their boat hit another boat, and um, all four daughters uh, actually got killed um, in this accident. And uh, his wife, Anna, um, sent a uh, letter back to him um, while he was still in Chicago, and all it said on there was, Saved Alone. You can imagine after losing everything that he had in his life, um, all his finances, everything, his ways to provide for his family, um, how bad that must have been on that end. And then uh, to then lose four daughters in the midst of this and then not knowing, I mean, he knows where his wife is, but like just the fact that um, the trauma that comes through things like that and just losing children and everything. A few weeks later, he himself has to go out on a ship and so as he's traveling on this ship, he comes to the exact point uh, where his daughters were killed. And he pauses in that moment. And he begins to describe that this supernatural peace came over him. He was a faithful follower of Jesus. But in that moment, as he stood there and he watched uh, um, uh, the waters and he watched where um, and started processing where everything had happened, um, the supernatural peace began to come over him. And tears began to stream down his face, and um, he immediately picks up a pen, and here's what he writes down. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. That's the kind of transcendent peace that can come through a life with Jesus. Let's pray. So God, today, uh, I realize that everyone's circumstances are so different. And I realize that we're all in a different place um, with relationships or just life in general. I realize that it could have been a really hard year for a lot of different people and for a lot of different reasons. But my prayer is, is that we would, through choosing you, that we would experience shalom. Through choosing you, that things would be complete and whole and put in its right place through choosing you, we would begin to experience this transcendent, transcendent peace that goes far beyond our current circumstances, no matter what they are. So God, part of the beauty of Jesus coming into this world was it leads to his death and his resurrection, and that death and resurrection brought ultimate peace. It restored the relationship between God and people. It made us whole. It made us new. It, it allows us to see things so differently. It gives us a kind of hope, and it's a gift, this hope that we have, that only you can give. We literally can't get it anywhere else. And it's only through you. So God, I just pray, um, 
if it's been a rough time where people came into this sermon today feeling just down and out, that they'll be encouraged to know the hope and the peace that's available through you. And so that they too will be able to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. In your name we pray, amen. Hey guys, before you get out of here, um, just a few things. One, here's a few questions that um, I wanted you guys to talk about in your watch parties. Uh, number one, how would you rate your level of peace from one to 10? Uh, number two, what is causing you to lack peace right now? And then number three, name two things you can start doing this week that will put you on a path of peace or path to peace. And uh, again, you guys, thank you uh, so much um, for your incredible generosity. And um, we're going to announce uh, the final numbers of the share offering this afternoon. And so you guys will be able to see that. And uh, we're just excited for uh, um, the results of that and uh, the impact that that's going to have in our city. Uh, you know, a lot of times we, we talk about generosity a decent amount in our church, not because uh, we want big salaries or whatever. It's not anything about that. It's about Man, this generosity helps people. This generosity reaches people for Christ. This generosity makes a difference in our city and a massive one. And so thank you for uh, being a part of the share offering. Thank you for all of you guys who decided, hey, I'm gonna start being a percentage giver and on a consistent basis. And uh, we've seen um, a bunch of you guys decide to do that um, based off the sermon from a couple weeks ago. And just really excited about that and how God is gonna work through all of that. So thank you for being a part of that. Um, love you all. And uh, we will see you all next week. Thanks so much for being a part of this morning with us. If you're out there and have questions, prayer needs, or want to talk to someone about next steps in your faith, then head on over to this link. We'll see you next week.